Welcome to the 15th lecture of riparian function and, uh, and management. This is lecture RM5, riparian assessment and monitoring. My name is Steve Nelly and I'll be the guest lecturer for today's lecture. So what is the difference between assessment and monitoring? They're sort of two different things, but they're related. An assessment simply means a snapshot of riparian conditions at a point in time, like a one-time evaluation, whereas monitoring usually indicates some sort of periodic tracking of riparian conditions to help us determine changes over time. So one analogy would be that, for example, if you go to the doctor for some condition or injury, he does an assessment of you for one time and, and tries to see what might need to be done, whereas monitoring would be a long-term systematic monitoring of perhaps blood pressure, cholesterol, liver enzymes, or whatever the issue may be. So they're both important, both in human health and in uh, riparian areas, both assessment and monitoring. There are both formal and informal methods of assessment and monitoring, and we'll look at and talk about a few of the different methods that, that are used. You've already been exposed to the bullseye evaluation, which is found in the Remarkable Riparian Field Guide, beginning on page 29, and we won't go through it in detail, but you've already seen how this is an informal assessment, looking at 10 different um, factors in riparian areas. So we won't take time to go through that again, but that's an example of an informal type of an, of an of assessment. There's a little bit more formal assessment that's called the Stream Visual Assessment Protocol, and it's called SVAP. There's actually a revision now that's called SVAP-2, and this is an assessment method uh, used by the Natural Resources Conservation Service in some states uh, to work with landowners on stream health. The SVAP elements uh, include an assessment of the condition of the channel, whether or not there are any hydrologic alterations, condition of the bank, the width of the riparian area, and canopy cover. So these are some of the functional attributes of this method, but the remainder of the elements actually have to do with aquatic habitat. So this method combines functional assessment with aquatic habitat assessment. So you look at water appearance and you rate the appearance of the water, how cloudy it is, whether there's any nutrient enrichment, whether there's, there's the presence of any manure, the nature of the pools, their depth and their frequency, and uh, whether there's any barriers to fish movement. You rate habitat complexity. Um, you make an assessment of the invertebrate community, which of course is the basis of the aquatic food chain. You look at whether or not riffles are embedded. That is the degree to which riffles are clogged up with sediment and silt. And then you determine whether there's any salinity issues. So uh, this SVAP is available online. If you wish to look at it, you can probably get also printed copies um, if you wish to kind of look at this a little bit more of a formal type of an assessment used by USDA employees. There's also informal methods of monitoring and assessment, and this involves going out to the creek and looking and observing, making notes, taking photos, uh, there are, there's an example of some of the notes, the kind of notes that would be helpful on uh, page 38 of the Riparian Owner's Manual, just to give you an idea of some of the kinds of things to be looking for and making note of. I'm sure you've already been exposed to the benefits of photo monitoring, where you go to the exact same location and take the same photograph at different points in time, and this is a form of monitoring. Uh, it's especially beneficial if the photos are combined with notes that you take at the time of the photograph. So this is a form of monitoring. You've seen, I'm sure, the Bear Creek uh, restoration 
photos from Central Oregon and again photos tell a really good and a story of change over time especially if they're combined with notes and narrative and in the case of the Bear Creek story uh, the photos are combined with some data collection so they cross they took a survey of the cross section of that photo point over time and noted the change in channel shape the change in floodplain over time how the channel narrowed and how the floodplain uh, increased and so the more information you can include in your monitoring the better there's also formal monitoring methods these are usually fixed systematic protocols which allow for repeatability over time greater precision accuracy and statistical relevance this is important because if different people go out to the creek over time, they'll be doing those that monitoring in exactly the same way as the previous crew. There's one fairly new monitoring method, a formal monitoring method, called multiple indicator monitoring, called MIM. This is developed by the uh, Bureau of Land Management, and the publication can be found in, uh, it's called TR, 23. It's available online. You can probably get a hard copy of it to uh, learn more about this monitoring method. But the metrics which are measured using MIM include stubble height, which is of course a reflection of grazing, percent browse use, the percentage of bank that's stable, the percentage of trees and shrubs which are in the sapling and young category, the green line stability rating, mean green line width, ecological status, which would mean early successional, mid successional, or late successional, the wetland rating, percent hydric vegetation, the size of the substrate, which is the size of sand, gravel, uh, and rock in the bottom of the channel, the frequency and depth of pools, And so this is one of the formal monitoring methods that's being used, especially in the western states uh, on grazing allotments, and probably has a lot of value if you take the time to receive the training to use the method properly. Uh, much of the information in MIM is taken from this publication by Dr. Al Winward. He was with the Rocky Mountain Research Station, an ecologist, it can be found in publication GTR 47, again, which is available to you if you want to establish a riparian library. Dr. Winward was one of the preeminent uh, riparian ecologists, and he established the system that we use on stability ratings on plants and how to uh, establish and identify the green line plant communities the first line of perennial vegetation at the edge of the water. So this monitoring approach of MIM uh, requires uh, multiple observations at fixed and uh, uniformly spaced quadrants along the green line. So the MIM method uh, does involve measurements and a lot of data collection and data recording. So it's one of the formal methods of riparian monitoring. And again, the goal of any monitoring is to quantify uh, with numbers uh, objectively the changes that are taking place. So photos are good, but data tells a little bit different story. So there's diff different kinds of monitoring, different kinds of assessment for different purposes. I'm going to spend the rest of this lecture uh, going through an assessment method called PFC. It is a function-based riparian assessment method which we have used quite a bit in Texas and which has been widely used across the southwest and the western states. This method is described in the publication, the technical reference called 1737-15 and this is the second edition of the book. Again, I think it's part of your uh, reading assignment for this course. I urge you to get it, become familiar with it, but this method was developed uh, 
by the National Riparian Service Team. It was developed over a long period of time with a lot of teamwork uh, from hydrologists and geomorphologists and the different disciplines you see listed there. It was field tested extensively, so it, it's really a good um, assessment method which has been successfully used in a wide variety of riparian conditions. So the PFC method, it's, it's called proper functioning condition, and that term is used in really three different ways. Uh, PFC is the name of the assessment method, so you could say, we're going to go out to Bear Creek and conduct a PFC assessment. But it's also one of the categories of riparian condition. So then you could say, we conducted a PFC assessment on Bear Creek, and we found that it is in proper functioning condition. So it's used in those two ways. Plus, we have found that the PFC assessment is a really good training and education tool. And we have found that it helps people really understand creeks and rivers and riparian areas and what's going on. And we found that when we teach riparian function and management to landowners and to natural resource professionals using this method, that they seem to have a high degree of understanding. They get it. They understand what's going on and how the riparian area works. So this method has uh, some good educational benefits. The PFC method is applicable to all perennial creeks and rivers. It is applicable to seasonal and intermittent creeks, those which may only flow for a part of the year, uh, but they have a alluvial water table which sustains uh, the area. The PFC method is not applicable to ephemeral channels, those that flow only in response to rainfall events. So don't try to use PFC on ephemeral channels. It won't work. It's not intended for that. It's important to know that the PFC method, it, the, the creeks and the channels are evaluated according to their potential and capability. As you know, there's lots of different kinds of channels. There's a lots of different looks. And so you wouldn't use the exact same criteria to evaluate this creek in Russia as you would the Medina River down below San Antonio. And you wouldn't use the exact same criteria to evaluate this as the Rio Gavilan in Old Mexico. Uh, you wouldn't apply that same exact criteria to this creek down near the Texas coast or this creek in West Texas. So you have to have the experience Someone on the team has to have the experience in that area to know what the potential is for creeks and riparian areas in that particular area. You just don't go out blind and do this method. You have to have some background and some experience and context. Using the PFC assessment method, we look at the function of the riparian area, not the values. And those are different and they're sometimes confused. The reason that we do this is because different people will have different things that they value and are important to them about a riparian area. So you may have people that are just interested in wildlife or bird watching or fishing. You may have someone else that's interested mostly in livestock production. So those values can differ and those values can create conflicts. but people can usually agree on function. So all the different value type judgments would be able to agree we all want a healthy functional riparian area. So that's why we emphasize function over values. And the goal is to help people understand what's going on. What are the underlying functional processes in the riparian system? And so the basis of PFC is pretty straightforward. How and why does a creek and riparian area operate and function the way it does? And you've already learned that riparian areas operate under the interaction of hydrology, 
the geomorphology, which is the erosion and deposition of soil material and vegetation. And therefore, when you conduct a PFC assessment, you don't ever go out there by yourself. It's always done with an interdisciplinary team. As a minimum, that team needs to have people with expertise in hydrology, with knowledge of geomorphology, and with knowledge of vegetation. At least those three disciplines need to be represented on a team that's doing a PFC assessment. Now you can have others that go along with different kinds of expertise, but you need to have people with some experience in those three areas to do a good job of a PFC assessment. You don't ever go out solo to do an assessment. When conducting a PFC assessment, or really other assessments too, you begin by looking at uh, the components of the creek, the parts. You're studying and evaluating the channel and the banks and the floodplain and the sediment and the base flow, the uh, flooding characteristics, the presence of a water table. You're looking at vegetation and large wood and uh, the organic inputs into the system. But you're not just looking at the parts, you're also looking at the processes and the dynamics that are taking place over time, the changes that are taking place. And I'm sure you've been already exposed to many of these things, but all of these things together are used to help conduct a PFC assessment. And really you're asking this simple question, is this riparian area functioning properly? And just by way of review, I know that you have uh, already been exposed to the definition of a properly functioning riparian area as one that has the adequate vegetation, landscape formation, or large woody material to dissipate energy, to stabilize the banks, to reduce erosion, to help trap sediment, which builds the floodplain and which stores water provides a place for flood water retention, provides for groundwater recharge, and therefore a uh, maintenance of base flow. These are those physical attributes that define a properly functioning riparian area. And you've also seen that these are what provide the basis for the values that society wants from creeks and rivers, the forage and the water quality and the wildlife and these things that people desire from creek. So one of the main take-home messages of this entire course is that the physical processes of function are what provide for the values that we want from creeks and rivers. So again, it's important to remember that it's the function that provides for and produces the values that we want. So I want to go through uh, the PFC uh, method very Quickly, it's a 17-point checklist. Uh, you will find this checklist on page 111 of the TR15 publication if you want to follow along. But there are five items that relate to hydrology. There are seven items that relate to vegetation and five items that relate to geomorphology. So it's in three sections. And so here's a summary of the PFC checklist. Item number one under hydrology simply asks, is there a floodplain that is accessible to frequent flood events? It's not asking the condition of the floodplain, it's just asking, is there a floodplain that's accessible in relatively frequent flood events? Yes or no? All of these items are answered with a yes or no, or in some cases, a not applicable. Item number two has to do with the stability of beaver dams. So if your creek doesn't have beaver dams, you skip it and you put an NA. But if the area does have beaver dams, you're, you're evaluating whether or not those dams are stable. Because an unstable beaver dam um, can really cause some problems. When those dams wash out, they can cause some real problems. But a stable beaver dam is actually usually a, a a good thing to see in a riparian area. Item number three has to do with an evaluation of the dimension of the channel, the pattern, 
in profile and whether or not those things are in balance with what would be expected in that area. This is where some local context is important. You need to have someone on that team who understands what should a creek look like in that area. And so here's where you're looking at the width depth ratio. You're looking at the degree of sinuosity or meandering in that channel and the gradient or steepness of the channel. And you can see now why you need to have someone on that team who is experienced in hydrology. Item number four on the checklist has to do with the width of the riparian area and whether or not the riparian area has reached its potential extent or whether it's increasing. Obviously in this photo there's an almost a near absence of any riparian area so this particular location would receive a really strong no answer. There's, there's really not a good riparian width at all. Big problem. And the last item under hydrology, item five, has to do with whether or not there are any impairments in the riparian area, visual impairments that can be traced to and caused by disturbances in the upland or something upstream. So we're looking at something like some perhaps gravel or caliche mining or some sort of construction which is delivering abnormal amounts of sediment to the channel. So you're looking at what is happening upstream and in the contributing watershed which might be impairing the riparian area. Beginning with the vegetation part of the checklist, item number six has to do with the diversity of stabilizing vegetation. Here we're looking for the minimal amount of diversity that's needed for recovery and maintenance of the riparian area. It's not asking whether it has the maximum uh, pristine diversity of plants, but just whether it has enough to begin to recover or maintain condition. So we're usually looking at you know, two or three species of grasses and sedges, two or three species of shrubs as that minimal criteria needed to uh, recover a riparian area. Item seven on the checklist has to do with the recruitment and reproduction of riparian plants. So you're forcing yourself to look specifically for young plants, young saplings, young shrubs, new plants of uh, sedges and grasses. And so here you see a young sycamore and it indicates that there's reproduction taking place. It's a really vital aspect of healthy riparian vegetation that it's actively reproducing. Item eight on the checklist has to do with plant species which indicate wetland conditions. So here's where it's important to know whether plants are obligate, facultative wetland plants or facultative and those plants that indicate that water is being stored in the banks and in the floodplain. And again, you're answering yes or no. Are those plants present or are they absent? Question nine on the checklist has to do with the presence of stabilizing plant communities on the bank. So again, here is where it's important that you understand the concept of stability rating and how strong rooted the plants are and whether they're strong enough to hold those banks together during high flow events. So again, you use your uh, field guide not only to identify the plants but to understand what their stability rating is. Now this item is not about how much vegetation there is, just whether or not those plant communities are present. Item 10 on the checklist has to do with plant vigor. We'll get into this more in the next lecture, but we know that what you see above ground on a plant is indicative of the health and stability of the root system. So a plant that's too heavily grazed or too frequently grazed is going to have a stunted root system. So you're evaluating plant vigor. And now question 11 on the checklist has to do with the amount of stabilizing vegetation. Not just whether it's present, but how much of it there is. And on most creeks and riparian areas in Texas, we want to see, we need to see a minimum of 70% coverage 
of stabilizing plants on both banks. Some creeks, some of the deep, what we call E-type channels in North Texas, East Texas, South Texas, they would actually need more like 90%. So uh, item number 11 under vegetation asks you to make an assessment, a visual estimate of how much of each bank is covered by stabilizing vegetation. Then item 12 on the checklist uh, is about is there a source, a future source of large wood? I'm sure you've already discussed the importance of large wood in channels and on banks. And so this question is not asking whether or not there is already wood in the channel. It's asking are there trees growing on the banks and on the floodplain that someday, 10, 20, 30, 40 years from now, those trees will become a source of large wood. So you're looking at the presence of trees along the banks. And in some creek settings that don't need to have large wood, you would just skip that and call it not applicable because in some areas, uh, some riparian areas don't require large wood. Beginning the geomorphology part of the checklist, item 13, has to do with energy dissipation. This question is asking, is there enough energy dissipating features to slow down the water of high flow events? Here's where you're looking for the presence of, could be boulders, could be vegetation, could be large wood, sinuosity, overflow channels, channel complexity, channel roughness, which slows down the water and you're evaluating, is there enough of those features to do the job to dissipate that energy, to slow down that water? Item number 14 has to do with whether or not point bars are becoming stabilized with vegetation. Many creek channels uh, meander back and forth and have point bars. And on those creek systems that do meander and form point bars, you want to evaluate whether those point bars are becoming actively stabilized by new vegetation. On channel types that do not form point bars, this would be a NA, not applicable. Item number 15 under geomorphology has to do with the lateral stability of channels, whether or not that channel is widening over time, becoming wider and wider and wider. If it is, that's usually a bad thing and there's some problems with that riparian area. So yes or no, is the channel laterally stable over time? And then item 16 has to do with vertical stability. That is, whether or not the bottom of the channel is eroding, down cutting. Here you see an active head cut which moves through the system, moves upstream, lowering the elevation of the channel. And this is a really bad thing to be happening to creek channels and riparian areas. And so if there is lateral or vertical instability, if there's down cutting taking place, then this question, this one question alone, if it's a no answer, would mean that you could not have a properly functioning riparian area. This is a, uh, a deal breaker in the assessment. If there's vertical instability and down cutting, you cannot have a properly functioning riparian area. The last item of the checklist, number 17, asks, is the discharge of water and the movement of sediment, does it appear to be in, in balance with what would be expected in that landscape setting. So again, you need to have somebody who is familiar enough with the fluvial geomorphic processes of that area to know whether it appears to be in balance. In this photo, it's pretty obvious that it's not in balance. There's excessive amounts of sediment being delivered into this channel, so this would be a no answer in this particular um, image. So the PFC assessment method is really a thought process and it helps people to be able to read the landscape, the art and science of reading that riparian area, figuring out what's going on. 
So here's the heading uh, that's used in the Texas version of the PFC checklist. You know, you put the creek name and, and the date and all those things. Uh, you describe the reach that you're evaluating, which could be as short as a quarter mile. It could be as long as two or three miles. But you evaluate and assess these creeks on a reach by reach basis. And then there's a block for describing what is the potential channel type and vegetation. And this is where you make notation of what is the potential for that area. So for example, we might say that this riparian area of uh, Bear Creek should be a single thread C type channel. That would be using the Rosgen stream classification system. It should have sinuosity. It should have stabilized point bars, large wood, frequent access to floodplain. The potential vegetation is a mix of sawgrass, emery sedge, switchgrass, sycamore, baccarus, walnut, with pecan on the terraces. So this would be what you're evaluating or judging your creek against. This would be the benchmark of uh, what the potential is. And so on this PFC checklist, you're going through with your team, walking, studying, evaluating, observing, up and down the creek, trying to answer each question with a yes or a no, or in some cases a not applicable. If your team cannot come to an agreement on some checklist items, we have what's called liners and tweeners, and you can you can make a note. We couldn't come to an agreement. It's somewhere between a yes and a no. Or you might say it's a really weak yes. And so making notes of why you answer each item the way it is, it's important. Here's some other important points. Is as, you, as the team is making this evaluation, you look in the book and you review the purpose that's behind each question. You don't try to rush the answer. You're very deliberate. You put a lot of thought into each checklist item and the material that's provided in the book. You make sure that everyone on the team has an equal chance to voice their opinions and perspectives on each item. You don't just uh, let the strongest member of the team uh, do the assessment. Everyone's opinion counts, and the more input, the better, the better the outcome. Make good notes under each checklist item of why you answer each item the way you did. The notes are probably more important than how you answer each question because they provide your rationale. And you use this process to understand what is happening in that riparian area. It's not just about arriving at a rating. It's about understanding what's going on. So for your final determination, the team spends whatever time is necessary on the creek, walking, studying, observing. There are three categories that you'll end up coming to a, an agreement on whether it's in proper functioning condition, functional, but at risk, or whether it's non-functional. And so we can see in a picture these categories of riparian condition, non-functional creek, after several years, management changes, it's functional, but it's sort of still at risk, or after a period of time and good management, it um, is restored to proper functioning condition. So a riparian area that's in PFC, this describes a state of resiliency that allows this riparian area to hold up and hold together during flood events, high flow events, uh, 10, 20, 30 year events, perhaps even a 50 or 75 year event. So they're resilient, they're stable. And if a big 100 year storm comes through there and does a lot of damage, then the concept of resiliency means that riparian area will, will bounce back quicker. So a riparian area that's in good functional condition will restore itself a lot better and faster. And a riparian area in PFC will meet the definition 
of a properly functioning riparian area. You've, been, you've seen this many times throughout this course and it will meet that definition of dissipating energy and the other attributes. It's important to remember that PFC does not mean a perfectly functioning riparian area. PFC is simply that threshold of when a riparian area begins to function properly but not perfectly. Think of uh, an analogy of if you make a C in your chemistry course, you know, you'd rather have an A or a B, but a C at least means you pass the course. And a PFC designation means that riparian area, it may not be perfect, but it's adequately functioning to do, to meet the definition criteria. So keep that in mind, that a riparian area that's in proper functioning condition can still usually be even better and it can improve above PFC condition. A functional at risk rating, which is abbreviated FAR, means a riparian area that is in functional condition partially or on a limited basis, but it has a high probability of damage and impairment during a 10 or 25 or 30 year high flow event. So it's gonna unravel, there's gonna be some damage uh, expected if a riparian area is functional but at risk. And of course a non-functional riparian area is one that clearly lacks the elements in the definition. There will usually be a majority of no answers on the checklist, but there will also usually be some yes answers. So uh, it's a consensus determination by the team uh, of what condition it's in. So for example, if you agree that after looking at all 17 checklist items that the riparian area is should be rated functional at risk then the next thing you do is you look at the thermometer to the right and you determine where on that scale is the condition and so if you decide that it's at it's a functional at risk system but it's very high functional at risk, it's not very far from being PFC, that tells you something a lot different than if it's at the lower end of functional at risk. So you attempt to put a mark on that thermometer of where it is along that line. And if you rate a riparian area at functional at risk, then you want to look at the trend. What is the apparent trend? What's really, what you think is happening? And if you think the trend is upward, then that's really a good sign because perhaps in a year or two it will be able to cross that line and become in PFC. Make good notes of why you rate the area the way you did. Notes that give you an indication of trend and uh, those are just as important as the final rating. There's also a section on the assessment that allows the team members to identify any things which might be hindering uh, that riparian area from be, being, becoming functional. And I think you've already been exposed to these hindering factors, so I won't go through them, but it gives a chance for the team to see what might be happening that could be keeping that riparian area from becoming functional. And this would be a good hint to the manager or the landowner of perhaps some changes that would be appropriate. So I hope that during this course and after this course, you will spend time on a creek, on creeks, on riparian areas, perhaps with classmates or others, evaluating, observing, studying, trying to learn what's going on in these riparian areas. You might use one of the uh, assessment or monitoring methods we've discussed, whether it's the bullseye method, whether it's the PFC, assessment. Perhaps later, if you receive the adequate training, you would actually be able to use the uh, MEM method. But don't discount the value of going out by yourself or preferably with others to watch and observe and make notes, take pictures of what's going on in a riparian method, in a riparian area. That can be a very valuable form of 
of assessment. And it's very true what has been said, that the more you look, the more you will see. The more you look, the more you're going to learn. So get out there on creeks, uh, with or without a formal method, and start watching and observing and uh, taking notes, learning about these riparian areas. An assessment or a monitoring method doesn't tell you exactly how to fix a degraded creek, but what it does is it helps the observer uh, to be able to understand those processes by which creeks recover. When waters spill out over the floodplain, when sediment is added to the floodplain and seeds of new plants, and as those plants begin to grow and thicken up and dissipate energy, you begin to learn how creeks respond um, to floods and to different practices, and you'll become a better riparian um, expert by studying and using these evaluation methods and monitoring methods. So this concludes lecture number 15 in the course, and uh, I've enjoyed being able to be a part of this course.